In the last segment, we took a look at a general overview of adding halo acids to alkene molecules, and we went through the basic mechanism for that. What we're going to do in this segment is go ahead and extend that concept to look at the possibility of doing carbocation rearrangements as a part of those addition reaction mechanisms. So let's go ahead and get started with that with a specific example problem here to illustrate situations where carbocation rearrangements will occur during the addition reaction mechanism. We're going to start with our alkene starting material. Our starting material is 3,3-dimethyl-1-pentene, as I've drawn above. We're going to react with HBr and try to walk our way through and predict what final major organic product would result from that. First things first, as we mentioned in the last segment, anytime you have acid present in a reaction mixture, be expecting that the first step of any mechanism is going to be protonation, where we will use a lone pair of electrons or a pi bond from our organic reactant to come over and grab a proton. So let's take a look at that for this situation. We'll go ahead and do our protonation step first, where by definition we're protonating the organic molecule. So when we're defining these terms here within the reaction mechanism, usually when we say protonation, it's protonation with respect to the organic molecule. So the organic molecule is what's picking up the proton here. So we have our starting material, bring in the HBr, and what's going to happen here is that that pi bond, as we saw in the last segment, is going to be acting as the base. It's going to come over and grab a proton from the acid, forcing the bond between H and Br to break. So the electrons from that bond are going to go onto the bromine, giving us bromide anion, as well as our carbocation intermediate. So we'll go ahead and make our carbocation intermediate. Like so. And remember that following Markovnikov's rule, which I'll go ahead and put on the arrow here since it's so important to keep in mind that Mark's rule is what we're obeying here always at the first step of the mechanism to predict what initial carbocation will result. We followed Mark's rule, which said to put the hydrogen on the carbon that has more hydrogens already. So that means the hydrogen is going to go here. And the purpose of that is that's going to allow us to put the carbocation at the location that will allow it to be more stable. So that's going to end up being right here. So when we go ahead and follow Mark's rule, we put our new proton right here at the end. So that would take the CH2 that was at the end and convert it into a CH3 group. And the carbocation, as a consequence of that, is going to go on the other carbon, the one that is next door to it. You will notice here in this particular example problem, our best case scenario for a carbocation from the protonation step following Mark's rule was a secondary carbocation. We had the option here of making a primary carbocation or a secondary carbocation. We chose to make a secondary carbocation. Now we think back to our discussion of SN1 reactions and E1 reactions in our earlier chapter. And we remember that with a carbocation forming reactions, that if we have a secondary carbocation, those can generally rearrange to make tertiary carbocations if it's possible to do so using a one, two shift. So anytime the protonation step of this mechanism gives a best case outcome of a secondary carbocation, you need to be looking for the possibility of a carbocation rearrange. So ask yourself here, can a 1-2 shift stabilize the carbocation? In other words, can moving a methyl group or a hydrogen over by one spot allow us to convert the secondary carbocation into a tertiary carbocation? If the answer is yes, then that carbocation rearrangement is going to be very, very favorable because it's going to lower the energy of the intermediate. So here we'll go ahead and call this step two. In this case, it is going to be possible to do a carbocation rearrangement to take that secondary carbocation and turn it into a tertiary carbocation. So this step is going to be a fast happening step because it's going to improve the stability of our intermediate. So I'm just redrawing that intermediate that we had there to start with, our secondary carbocation. We're going to do that 1-2 shift, where the 1-2 is referring that we're moving a methyl group or a hydrogen from position 1 over here to position 2. We're moving a methyl group that's located here to the adjacent carbon or a hydrogen that's move over to the adjacent carbon. 
So we'll go ahead and do that. And in this particular situation, the thing that's going to make sense to do is going to be a one-two shift of one of these two muscle groups that I've put in red here. And so what we can show happening if we sketch this out, take that muscle group, move it over by one spot, and that's going to allow us to convert that secondary carbocation that we have here initially into a tertiary carbocation. So we had to start with two methyl groups here. It's now become one because the second methyl group has moved over to here. And just to make sure our electron bookkeeping is accurate, remember that this carbon to start with was a CH group. And so it's still a CH group. Now it's got that extra methyl, so therefore it has a complete octet. And it's going to be this carbon over here that is now our carbocation. And therefore, we've taken our secondary carbocation, we've converted it into a tertiary carbocation. This second step of carbocation rearrangement is absolutely only going to happen if we can take a carbocation and stabilize it by making it a tertiary carbocation out of a secondary carbocation. So let's go ahead then and continuing onward, working toward our final major product. We've added that step of carbocation rearrangement relative to the mechanisms we looked at before. Always have that in mind as you're looking through these that that could be a possibility and do it if it's possible to make a more stable carbocation. Now that we've made that more stable carbocation, we're going to go ahead to the next step, which is where the nucleophile is going to attack the electrophile. And just like in the earlier examples we saw of these types of addition reactions, the nucleophile is going to be the anion, that's the bromide, and the electrophile is going to be our carbocation. And so we'll take the bromide anion, and the bromide anion is going to come in. I'm just redrawing the carbocation that we provided there at the end of step two. So the carbon that's charged is right there. Nucleophile is super strongly attracted to it. It comes over, mates with it, forming that new covalent bond from the bromine to the carbocation. And now we are finishing up this mechanism by plugging in your bromine right here. So that's our bromide anion has now formed a covalent bond. And I'll show that newly formed covalent bond here in red for emphasis. And the next thing we can ask ourselves about this reaction is we can ask ourselves, is this reaction regioselective? Remember that regioselective means that the reaction has a preference for making a specific constitutional isomer over others that are hypothetically possible. And in the case of this reaction, this reaction is definitely regioselective because of the fact that we could hypothetically there at the first step have made a couple of different carbocation intermediates. We chose to make the secondary carbocation instead of the primary carbocation, and that's going to lead us to a different product than if we'd made the primary carbocation there. And so we definitely do have a preference here for which constitutional isomer we make out of this reaction. We, in other words, we have a preference for which carbon atom picks up the H and which picks up the Br, and therefore there is a selectivity going on here. We can also ask ourselves the question of whether this reaction is stereoselected. Does it have a preference for making a specific stereochemistry in the product? So in order to think about whether this is stereoselective or not, we have to first look at are there any chiral centers that we have manipulated in going from the reactant to the product? And indeed there is. We've made a chiral center right here at this location. That carbon has four different groups bonded to it, therefore it's a chiral center. And hypothetically, this could be R, S, or an equal mixture of the two. And so we would describe the reaction as stereoselective if there's a preference for one over the other. In other words, if there's a preference for making R over S, or a preference for making S over R, the reaction would be stereoselective. On the other hand, if the two enantiomers are formed in equal quantities, no preference for either one, just a random mixture, we would say the reaction is not stereoselective. So to think about whether this is stereoselective, we need to look at the intermediates and specifically the point in the mechanism where the stereochemistry is introduced. And that point in the mechanism where the stereochemistry is introduced is going to be here at step three. So at step, step three, we have no chiral centers present at the beginning of the step because this carbon right here is going to be expected to be trigonal planar because it's a carbocation, a carbon that has just three regions of electron density. Therefore, that portion of the molecule is going to lay flat. And as a consequence of it being flat, the bromide anion can attack it from either the top face 
or the bottom face. And that's going to give rise to an equal mixture or approximately equal mixture of the two different chiralities at that carbon once it becomes chiral. So the bromide here can attack from top or the bottom of the carbocation. No real preference there due to the fact that a carbocation is trigonal planar. And so that's going to lead to a mixture of R and S stereochemistries at the chiral center that's going to result there. And whenever we have a mixture of the R and S with no preference for either, we would say that the reaction is not stereoselective. It's not preferring a specific stereochemistry. Instead, it's making essentially a random assortment of R and S at that location. So in this case, the two possible enantiomer products are going to be formed in equal quantities, meaning the reaction is not stereoselective. When we describe that product as being a racemic mixture, racemic mixture is a mixture of enantiomers where the two forms, the R and the S formed, form are yielded in equal quantities. So this is expected to be a racemic mixture of the two enantiomers. So let's go ahead and draw in the stereochemistry for this. So I'm going to make my wedge to bromine, bromine dash back to our methyl group, and then we'll just draw the molecule the same down here, but switch all our dashes to wedges and wedges to dashes to make the two possible enantiomers. So if you were asked to draw all the major products of this reaction, including stereochemistry, you would need to draw both of those two structures that we have shown there at the bottom, because those are going to show the two different stereoisomers that we can form as a result of this reaction. Now what I'm going to do is give an example problem that I'd like for you to take a moment to work through on your own, and then we're going to go through the solution for that problem. So here's the example. Here's the example problem. I want you to take a look at it, hit pause, work through it, and then hit play to go through the solution. Looking at the solution to this, to get started, we need to draw out our starting material of 3-methyl-1-hexene, and we're given the information there that we are working with the S enantiomer. So we'll go ahead and draw out our planar structure to start with of 3-methyl-1-hexene. So I'm going to go ahead and put in my hexene there at carbon number 1 draw out my six carbon chain, and then at carbon number three, I'm going to plug in my methyl group. And we're looking at the S configuration here. There's only one chiral center, that's at carbon number three, so that's where we have to plug in the S. And we'll go ahead and do this. I'm just going to randomly decide that I'm going to put this as a wedge or a dash, decide whether I've got the stereochemistry right or not, and then change it if it's wrong. So it's kind of a guess and check approach here. So highest ranked group is going to be our carbon atom right there, going to the alkene. Second highest ranked group is going to be our three carbon chain. Third highest is going to be our methyl group. So in fact, what I've drawn right here would actually be the R enantiomer. And so I'm just going to, to get this correct, to the S enantiomer. I'm going to change that wedge to a dash, and that should allow creation of the enantiomer. So now looking at going from highest ranked second highest strength to third highest strength will allow us to show that this is the S enantiomer, the S configuration. Okay, so we're going to, what we'll do now then is bring in our HCl to get this mechanism underway. So our HCl comes in, hopefully you recognize that the first step in any mechanism that involves acid here is going to be protonation. So we bring the pi bond over as our proton acceptor. It grabs that proton from the acid, forcing the bond between H and Cl to break. And we want, as a result of this acid-base reaction step, step one of the mechanism, our protonation step, to create the most stable carbocation intermediate we possibly can here. So I'm going to go ahead and do what's hopefully the easy part first, fill in that chloride anion. And hopefully the rest of this part is easy for you as well. So we're going to draw in our carbon skeleton, keeping our stereochemistry there at that carbon number three because we haven't done anything to react it yet. Then we decide where we're going to put our proton at. So we started off with CH2 here at the end and that's the carbon that has more hydrogens on it to start with. So therefore it's going to be the one that picks up the new proton following Mark's rule. The adjacent carbon is going to be the one that becomes our carbocation. So we'll go ahead and fill that in. So we've made a secondary carbocation here which is the best case scenario out of this first step, the protonation step where we're following Mark's rule. 
And then secondly, what we need to do is keep in mind the possibility of a carbocation rearrangement because we've made a secondary carbon here at the beginning. So can we do a rearrangement using a one, two shift to convert that into a tertiary carbocation? So I'm gonna go ahead and show this hydrogen atom here at carbon number three explicitly. And I've shown it as a wedge since we do need to make that a tetrahedron if we're showing stereochemistry at this point. So step two is gonna be our carbocation rearrangement. And to rearrange the carbocation in order to make the most stable carbocation possible, taking that secondary carbocation and making it a tertiary, we need to move this hydrogen over. So we take it and the two electrons that covalently bond it to the carbon, move those over, and that's going to enable us to make a tertiary carbocation. So now, redrawing our skeleton here, that carbon number two of the chain has gone from being a CH group to being a CH2 group because we move the hydrogen over from carbon three to carbon two. And now it's gonna be carbon number three that will be our carbocation. Carbon number three still has that methyl group attached which we previously showed as a dash. Now that this carbon is our carbocation, we no longer wanna show that as a dash, we need to show it as a line because the shape of this carbocation is gonna be trigonal planar. So we no longer have stereochemistry there at the carbon that is now a carbocation because that carbon only has three regions of electron density. So it's gonna be trigonal planar. Now that we've made our most stable carbocation that we possibly can, to wrap up this mechanism and lead us to the final product, we're gonna take that carbocation that we generated as a result of step two in the mechanism, and we will have our chloride anion come in and form a bond to that. So we'll have the chloride anion acting as our nucleophile. It comes in, uses the lone pair of electrons to attack the carbocation like so, forming a new bond to it. And that's going to lead us to our final product. So we'll go like that, forming a new bond between chlorine and our carbocation. Now we look at this and we notice that we have just created a new chiral center in the molecule right here. And so we do need to keep stereochemistry in mind since the question asks us to include stereochemistry in our response. And so in this case, we would expect this reaction to be not stereoselective because we have the chloride anion there at step three attacking a trigonal planar intermediate, which means that we could have both stereochemical orientations resulting here. And so I need to really draw this structure twice and show that we have some wedges and dashes going on to represent the two different stereochemistries. So here we'll start with the chlorine on a dash, the methyl on a wedge, and then switch it up to put the dash to the methyl, wedge to the chlorine to make the R and S enantiomers of this. So these would be our two major products of this reaction, an expected racemic mixture of these two enantiomers. So we've shown the two different possible stereochemistries there at that carbocation that just became a chiral center. So now looking at parts B and C, we can ask ourselves, is the reaction regioselective? The answer to that is yes, it is, because at that first step, hypothetically, the hydrogen could have formed a bond to either carbon number one or carbon number two of the chain, but in actuality had a preference for forming a bond to carbon number one. And so that led us to making a specific constitutional isomer product at the end, rather than making a few different constitutional isomers in random. Second question here, is the reaction stereoselective? And the answer here we've sort of already addressed and the answer to that is no, it's not stereoselective because our final product represents all of the possible stereoisomers that could hypothetically be made are being made rather than there being a preference for one over the other. So we look here at our final product. Our final product has one stereocenter. And so therefore the total number of stereoisomers that could form using the two to the n rule is two to the one, which equals two we actually are indeed making two stereoisomers, and so therefore there is no selectivity, no preference for one over the other, so the reaction therefore is not stereoselective. In the next segments, what we're going to look at are some additional types of addition reactions where rather than adding HCl across the carbon-carbon double bond, we're going to be adding things like Cl2, water, and a variety of other components adding across the bond. So we'll try to draw some parallels between the reactions that we've looked at here with adding halo acids, these other reaction types that we're going to look at down the road. Stay tuned for that.